cloud. Then we'll share my screen. On our chapter two, we will begin. Okay. So when I was setting it up, you know, it was like, hey, I'm just going to um, put chapter two in the antigen antibody category that we need to cover. And so that's why this kind of got passed over first. So we're going to back up and go through it a little bit. It's not a long chapter, but it is helps for chapter four. Okay, so basically we're looking at the nature of the antigens and this MHC, the major histocompatibility complexes. So it's kind of going to introduce us to some more terms. Traits of immunogens, and it talks a little bit about you know, epitopes and haptins, relationship of antigen to the host, and then it gets into this MHC because when we start talking about selecting the T cell and we start talking about binding to an MHC1 or 2, we kind of need to know what those are before we start talking about the binding. So that's why we're kind of backing up a little bit. So this is kind of leading out of chapter one where we, we introduce the immune response, the adaptive response. And this is good to remember. If you don't have this down, it's a good review. Um, as our patients age, they decrease their antigenic responses. Their, their immune system slows down, okay? To the point where you're gonna learn in next spring, in your spring semester, in blood bank, you'll learn that we don't really worry about blood bank issues with older people, okay? That can be kind of forgotten. It can be kind of like, oh, they're, they're 80 years old. Like, what kind of response are they gonna have, okay? I personally don't like that with blood bank. I like to be exact. If somebody's still showing an, an antibody to types of blood, I don't like to ignore that and just say, oh, they're old and what difference does it make, right? But this is where that concept comes from, that as you age, as you get older, as you get to be a senior, your, your response to antigenic stimulation is decreased, okay? So you just don't mount a full-on immune response to things. Neonates, same thing, like babies, right? Babies' immune system are not fully developed, and that's where we get the concept of, you know, mother's antibodies that cross the placenta help the baby survive until the baby's immune system revs up. So, so we see that, and if any of you have children, you realize like, wow, when I took, brought you home, you never were sick. You know, for the first six months, it was beautiful. And now, now from six months to a year and a half, you're sick every day, right? It's because their immune system was, was basically yours, okay? They had your antibodies protecting them in the first, you know, months of their life and then they had to start experiencing their own antigen and then produce their own antibodies. Don't they still get some kind of protection of breastfeeding? Yeah, yeah, any of that. So that just aids the, the, yeah. the longevity of the transfer of in, uh, immunoglobulins from mom to baby. So there's a lot of things, our overall health, if we're malnutritioned, if we're fatigued, if we're stressed, we know our immune system responds to that and we have our classic case of the shingles, right? The reemergence of chickenpox, varicella, zoster. Um, you know, most people will say, well, you know, I'm, as I'm getting older or, hey, I'm having a real stressful time in my life and my immune system's kind of like says, well, you know what, I got a surprise for you. Here's some shingles for you, all right? So we know that plays a part in how we deal with um, some of our antigens, all right? So factors influencing your immune response, you know, intravenous, yes, that's not, you know, phlebotomy, you want to you get somebody revved up, you know, just, just contaminate a needle and apply it into their vein, reuse a needle, reuse syringes, that's why we think, you know, our IV drug users are very vulnerable to diseases because if they're sharing needles, sharing syringes, then they're, they're putting it right into their circulatory system. We got intradermal under the skin, subcutaneous um, a skin again, oral. The dose, you know, the larger the amount of the immunogen, the 
greater the immune response. So we've had a lot of debate these last few months on COVID about dose. Healthcare workers, you know, at first we were told, you know, healthcare workers were dropping, like, you know, everybody dying from taking care of COVID patients. Don't hear that as much anymore, do we? It's not on the news. It's not like uh, nurses are dying, doctors are dying. Help us, help us, help us. Like, you know, we got a lot of that. Just added to all the stress. You know, and it, and it just adds to the this whole story of you know they're getting a higher dose. Is that the problem? They're getting COVID after COVID patient, and they're just getting bombarded. And that big of a dose is putting them into the ICU and putting them in the death bed because they're getting so much of the virus at one time, and they just can't handle it that that much, right? So we know that's the scenario. That's the stories we hear. We also know very large doses can induce tolerance. So, you know, if you get a big dose of an antigen, then you can tolerate exposure, re-exposure, right? And then we say genetic capacity predisposition. And I think what we're gonna see with COVID is this is a big, 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 big thing, okay? People are saying it, it has this way. It's, it's a certain genetic, it's a certain cult, uh, not culture, but certain, um, race, different origins, they, you know, is it, is it their health? No. Is it something genetically? Maybe. So I think we're going to see a lot more on COVID right here with genetic. And some people are, are just like, I didn't even know I had it. Some people are like, oh my gosh, you know. So we, we don't know yet. So this story is being written as we live and it's hard to deal with it because of that. <clears throat> So immunogenicity, like how strong is the, the immunogen? How strong is the antigen? And, and basically we use those interchangeably if you read through chapter two. And we, we introduced that a long time ago. It seems like a long time ago, it's probably just last week. We introduced that idea that not all antigens are immunogens, but all immunogens are antigens. You know, they're like, oh, okay, play on words, yes, but that's what it is. All our antigens that we get exposed to do not elicit an immune response that we can measure or we know about. We don't know exactly what it's doing, but we're not getting sick, okay? But in immunogen, we know that's an antigen that has the capabilities of, the, of a body response. And we know size plays a big thing, part of that. So, you know, at least 10,000 Daltons is considered the size you need, and but most are active at 100,000 Daltons. So the bigger the antigen, the more the body will respond to it. How foreign is it? You know, we're seeing that firsthand, right? The novel, new, never been exposed to this virus, made a huge difference, right? I mean, pandemics don't just happen. They, they, it was new. Nobody in the world had been exposed to it, and it just went like wildfire. Right, because you couldn't stop it. You could, couldn't say, okay, this person has it, right? And we, and we were in this. We were in the lab a little bit. We were in the lab of parasitology and virology last spring, and it was like, okay, we're we're locking down. We're 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 closing up travel, but let's bring a three hundred people over on a plane that were over in where. They were in Italy, they were in China, they were in Britain, wherever they were, let's just bring them, right? And we'll watch them for 14 days and then let them go, right? So we didn't, the biggest problem that everybody saw with that was we didn't have a test, right? We didn't, we had this fumbling out of the, the gate with a test that CDC might have a test, it might be working, we don't know, the batch was bad, the collection didn't, the, all these things that we went through at the beginning, but we couldn't just say, hey, we're going to make sure we never see it over here. And it just came, right? Nobody's been exposed to it. Nobody had an immunity to it. So there we go. It's still revving through. I don't know. Y'all check your A state daily COVID report that you see on the website. Are y'all into it like that? Or y'all just like that? Ah. Right? Clicked on it once because he said on an email. Clicked on it once. Maybe. Well, just so you know, it's climbing a little bit, right? We got students that have 
cases, like positive cases. Most are students. There's no faculty right now with positive. Um, huh? And there's no one, huh? What building? We don't know buildings, but I, I can tell you what it was yesterday because I'm kind of nerdy into this kind of thing, right? So it's like students living on campus, we're up to 10. I mean, that's not bad for how many That's years. not bad, no, no that's not bad. And, and this is, you know, and those will be done in a few days. Um, not die, but they'll be done with their, <laughs> they'll be done with their active case, right? Oh my God. Students living on campus or off campus, that's 45. So we got 45 students off campus. We got zero employees, one vendor, and uh, 56 total. That's 56 active cases with your population of what 15,000 maybe maybe I think that's it counting faculty and all everybody um foreigners right so if it's a foreign antigen it is no fun because it spreads um we talk about epitopes key portion of the immune is recognized in the immune response so an antigen can be humongous right and then, but there's one select portion that really the immune system will key in on. It's the one thing that makes it the most antigen part of the antigen, if that makes sense. That's just basically what an epitope is. Okay. So it might be a sequence of the protein. It might be uh, what we're going to see with these markers. We're going to see things sticking out of the membranes. It can be any of those things, and you go, ah, that's what makes an antigen. Okay, so you see this, it's talking about conformational epitope. This is an amino acid and the proteins, you know, swing around and bind on them, you know, make their structure. And then you see we got, we got a, looks like a, uh, maybe a B cell trying to come in here and then an IgG trying to come in here and find a link or find a binding spot of the antigen itself. We have a thing called Hapton. Aptin is by itself is non-immunogenic. It's a material that creates a new antigenic determinant when it combines with a carrier. So the Aptin itself is going to become the antigenic determinant when it finds a good carrier molecule. Okay, so it can react with the antibody even without being complex to the carrier molecule. But to make it in you know, immunogenic, it needs a carrier molecule. So a haptin, you know, it's that little piece that the immune system likes, but the immune system really can't get a, a bearing on it. So it doesn't really respond until it finds a carrier molecule that makes it larger, right? So we think about the size creation of a carrier molecule and then having a haptin link onto it. So you see that when bound to carrier, so these will be our carriers here, the big circles, okay? And then the red triangles here are the haptons, okay? So once they, by themselves, a little red triangle here, the hapton, it's not too good, but hey, you give me a carrier molecule, then I can do an, you know, an agglutination reaction, which we saw uh, yesterday uh, in micro, right? For those are in micro. Adjuvants can make immunizations more effective. They work by targeting antigen uh, presenting cell. They're important in the adaptive immune response. They protect the immunogens from being degraded. Okay, so an adjuvant would be added to, hmm, let's say maybe a vaccine, right? We put an adjuvant in the vaccine to protect the antigen. And why would we want to do that with a vaccine? Why well, do we want to protect the antigen? Anybody, anybody know their vaccine times? What's that? So the body will be able to use the antigen? Yeah. Well, if it doesn't have the adjuvant to help it survive a little longer, the body will just clear it too quick. Yeah. Right. We need that we need that antigen to hang around a little bit with a vaccine. To give our bodies a chance to get our get an immunity up to it. So if, but if that like the antigen is like, oh, I got an antigen and your body goes, oh, that's it, bye, All right? Then, then we're still susceptible to the antigen. We'll be still susceptible to the flu, right? 
because we didn't get a chance to build up any antibody. We didn't get to see it long enough to so get our time. Are bees in all immunizations? Adjuvants in all? Yeah. I would say yes. Unless it's a live vaccine, yeah, I would say an adjuvant has to protect the, because we're just talking about bits and pieces of the whatever we're trying to protect ourselves from. So right now, you know, they're going through this big study with, with the COVID vaccine, right? They're in stage three, which means they're giving it to a bigger group. When it started off small, just to make sure you, you know, you could survive basically, that it's not causing any harm. And then it was a listening immune response. Then you go to stage three, where you take a big group of people, right, and give them the vaccine. And then if they all come out of it looking good and everything looks good, where they do get immunity, there's no long term issues, there's no problems, then it'll go to stage four. And that's when they say, come down to the union and everybody get a shot of the COVID vaccine, <laughs> right? That's stage four. We're almost there, right? We're getting close. Right. Are you gonna wait before you get it a little while? Why would I wait? Because yeah, it affects other people. Yeah, how long does the stage three have to wait? Yeah, that's like uh, stage we stage hope as long as they need it, right? Okay. Right. It, it's 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 got factors of indicators before they'll go. Okay, we we've, we've seen it. We think we we got it. So the, the company's has. not the companies aren't gonna put out a vaccine until they know you're not gonna come back with Morgan and Morgan and break them, right? Because if they put out something bad, then you, you'll, they'll be broke next week, you know, like next month yeah. kind of thing. So there, there's a process to developing this thing. Um, but it's going to, you know, just thinking out loud, I think they're going to present it in a way that's going to be, if you'll do this, then we can take mask off and we can go back to way it was and we can put everybody back in the classroom and we can go to concerts and all that good stuff. I think that's how it's going to unfold. Well, now so it's going to be very encouraging for you to go get that vaccine. All right. So fingers crossed it's here, you know, before too much longer and then we can we can do that. So if we have everybody, hey, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got the vaccine. And then we can start taking things back, back down. All right. Uh, we have some autoantigens and alloantigens. So these are some good definitions that we need to kind of pick up on before we move through. An autoantigen belongs to the host. Makes sense. They do not usually evoke an immune response. If the immune response occurs, it's an autoimmune condition is likely. So we look at our classic uh, hypothyroidism. You know, we we basically had our the the auto antigen became your own thyroid gland, okay, and your body produces antibody to it and it's taxed it. So same thing with diabetes type one. You know, in the pancreas, the beta cells are there producing insulin. Somehow, some way, your body early on decides it doesn't like beta cells in the pancreas and it attacks them and destroys them. So autoimmune, if we could get a handle on what is leading to that, what is the, what is the signals that lead to a production of a Hashimoto's antibody against your thyroid or you know, antibody against your pancreas. You know, if we could get that, maybe we'd get those issues taken care of. Uh, alloantigens, they're from other members of the host species, such as a transplantation or a blood transfusion. So you get alloantigens if you take a blood unit from somebody else, okay? Those red cells that they put in your body have different antigens on them that now you've been exposed to, and it doesn't take much okay we know that with blood that you can take a cc a few drops whatever it may be you don't have to have a whole bag okay so it doesn't take much for your body to start producing antibody against that antigen so we have to the antigen type you so the whole idea of blood bank is to put you through you know check your serum for antibodies against the antigens if you're about to get somebody else's blood so we cross match it, we screen it, and you'll get all that in, in immunoheme next semester. But those are alloantigens. 
Heteroantigens, those are from other species such as animal plants or microorganisms. So how do we get exposed to heteroantigens? What'd y'all have for breakfast, right? Anybody have sausage biscuit or did you have uh, bacon, right? Intake, right? We're intaking antigens all the time. Those are heteroantigens from other species, other animals. Did you have a salad? You know, wh wh wherever you took in, yes, you were taking in heteroantigens. We have this idea that we'll see a lot in this class in the lab, it's called a heterophil antigen. A heterophil antigen exists in plants or animals. But, okay, so we got antigens here in plants and animals. They're identical to or closely related to the structure, so the antibody to one will cross-react with the antigen of the other. Example, antigen from a pneumococcus bacteria cross-react with type B blood group antigens, okay? I know you're thinking, well, that makes no sense whatsoever. But what it is, is, is that we can create, and one of the heterophils that we see for us, if we, if we create a heterophil antibody, okay? So that means we're, we've got an antibody we test with a cell from a, another species to detect that heterophil. So our bodies are producing this heterophil antibody when we're sick, and we see it with things like mm, mononucleosis, okay? We do that. We test for mono by looking for not monoantibodies, but heterophil antibodies. Okay, so it's really neat when we do it in lab, and you're gonna get lectured and lecture over this again. But we see that all of a sudden, we can take a cell from a cow, okay, and we have antibodies that react with that cell from a cow, but how did we do it? We got exposed to a virus. So the same thing here, they're saying is if you get exposed to pneumococcus bacteria, it's just like you had type bleed, B blood given to you. So you can have antibodies to B because you had pneumococcus. So is it pretty random? Yeah. Pretty random? Yeah. That we can have heterophil produced with different infections, yeah. There's a lot of different infections that cause it, but we use the mono test for that, look for that. So it's real neat to, I mean, you think about how did we even think about this reaction? I mean, it's fascinating, yeah, I just, I mean, like, yeah. how did we think about that? So we finally get to where we wanted to get, which is the major histocompatibility complex molecule. We didn't want to, you know, leave it out there to because this is the main reason we, we wanted this chapter so we're on page 21 in the book in the chapter we got some some details to go through are y'all doing okay in zoom land okay thanks rachel appreciate it um and tristan all right so major histocompatibility complex we talk about that link to genetic capability that allows the body to mount an immune response. They've been found on all nucleated cells. You remember their very first name was human leukocyte antigens, but these have been found on all cells. So we have to do this typing of MHCs before what? Before you would get a transplant, right? You, you, when you say you're a good match, well, what you're matching is your MHC structures on your cells. So you'll get a match on how well those do because they play a pivotal role in the development of humoral and cellular immunity. And we're, that's where we're leading to. They determine whether transplanted tissues is histocompatible, whether it's accepted or rejected. They bring antigens into the body, to the surface of the cells for recognition by the, BT, the T cells. And that's where we kind of were at the end of lecture on Monday, was we were just getting into that, what makes that T cell T positive, double positive, right? And this is what it is, right? This MHC. So that's why we put a little stop there and we said, we got to go over MHCs first. So when they're combined with the antigen on the surface of other cells, they activate T cells. This 
you know, would you get a question about chromosome six? You never know, okay? But if somebody asks you <laughs> which chromosome is responsible for major histocompatibilities, chromosome six, okay? It's just one of those numbers of a chromosome you kind of need to start keying in on. And luckily for you, I know you don't think this is lucky, but we have mapped the entire human genome now, okay? I wasn't, I wasn't in, I think I was in college when it started. It took like, oh, forever. And they were like, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. We're going to know every gene, what does, function, whatever, what causes this, all this stuff. And we can just get a gene pattern on everybody. And we'll know if you're going to be an alcoholic or have cancer, right? It's kind of the scenario of work. So if you watch the Human Genome Project, it was this big undertaking that was really, really slow, really, really slow, and then all of a sudden it was done, right? Y'all know what happened for it to be just done? Computers. It was like, like when it first started, computers were so bulky and big and slow, and they just took forever to process like all the gene sequences of every chromosome in the human body, right? So it was doing this and doing this, and then as computers got to the, you know, in your hand, it was like, whoo, we got it done. So yeah, it's done. So yay for us, we got the Human Genome Project finished. When did it get finished? Um, I think about 91-ish, two-ish, somewhere in there. I, you, you can probably look it up, you'll probably tell me I'm wrong, but it's, it's been done for a while. Yeah. Okay, but it started back in the 80s, I think, I think. But anyway, we have, we have for us, we know these things. So we know that chromosome six is responsible for coding for the major histocompatibility molecules. They're divided into three classes. We're gonna focus on two, okay, but there are three. There's class one found on three different loci, the designated ABC, we're gonna see this, I, we're just kind of rolling here. Class two found on the D region, so one is ABC, two is D, then we get DRQP, and then class threes are found in the region between class one and class two, and we give them codes C4A, C4B, C2, and B complement, for, or they code for those, oh sorry, oh that's some, that's some complement stuff that's coming up pretty soon, right? Yeah, those are complement molecules. So we'll revisit the class three when we get there. Class one and two are involved in what we want to talk about right now, which is the antigen recognition. They influence the antigens to which T cells respond. So that T cell that came into the thymus last lecture, they're going to encounter class one and class two MHC molecules. Okay. Class three, secreted proteins that have immune function, but they're not expressed on the cell surfaces, but we'll see class three again we get to complement that. So we just focus on one and two right now. Oh, there's some variation here. Alleles are alternate forms of the gene, slightly different. So human leukocyte A, human leukocyte antigen A, human leukocyte antigen B, and human leukocyte antigen C have 2,000, 2,600, or 1,500 different alleles. A lot, okay. That's basically what I want you to know. It's a lot. Here is the chromosome six. We said it's a section of the short arm. If you were, love your genes and you want to know what chromosome six looks like and where that actually occurs, it's right here. Okay, and we see class one. We said it was A B C, but it's kind of backwards there. We said class three was in between. We see that it codes for complement 4B, complement 4A, and complement 2. And we see class two has a DP region, DQ region, DR region. And we see things like alpha and beta, alpha 1, beta 1, beta 3, alpha 2, beta 2, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. Okay, so hopefully you're getting a handle of your alpha betas because we're about to see those in a minute. So remember, we're focused on class one and class two MHC molecules because that's what drives our T cell. So I think you know this because MHC genes are closely linked. 
inheritance for grouping is known as a, a haplotype. And I, I know you probably hadn't had that. I think my son had to know that from eighth grade science. Okay. He went, yeah, I think I remember studying over the sheet what a haplotype was. Y'all remember genetics in eighth grade? Sure you do, right? You do. One haplotype is inherited from each parent. Okay, so hopefully you know that, that, you know, with genes, we get half of that, and then it does some mixing that makes you unique, because if it didn't mix, you know, every person your parents had would look exactly the same, right? But we have mix and we have variety, so we don't all look like the same kid, right? Yay for that. Or maybe not gay for that. So here's class one, MHC molecules. These are expressed on all nucleated cells. Okay. And I think we, you know, we moved on from this and we said not only that, but we see them. Right? We, they are highest, right? And we're kind of moving on to 22, and we'll probably have that again, right? They're the highest, here it is, sorry. They're highest on the lymphocytes and the myeloid cells. Their lowest are undetectable on liver, hepatocytes, liver cells, neural cells, which are nerve cells, muscle cells, and spermatozoa, germ cells, right? So class one, highest, on lymphocytes and myeloid cells. Yay, that would be something I would remember. Mark that down for class one MHC molecules. And go to, um, let's say your summary. Summary here. Yeah, I found on. The summary on 28, you're just kind of, hey, he talked about the summary, but what is that summary? Summary is your study notes. MHC1 molecules are found on all nucleated cells associated with foreign antigens, such as viral proteins, synthesized, right? See that there. And we're going to talk more and define it here in just a sec. So here it is. Uh, MHC molecules are glycoprotein dimers. Okay, so two parts of a glycoprotein. Okay, so there's one part. Here's the other part. And they made up of two non covalently linked polypeptides, so non covalently linked. And here's what you're going to see is you see alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. Okay, that is that big alpha unit here. And then we have a beta 2 over here. Okay. And you know you got to see something over here. That's you know we said six, but over here it's fifteen. Anyway, class one molecules will appear like this in all your drawings. Here is our cytoplasmic membrane. Okay, and they stick out. Okay, so this MHC molecule sticking out of the membrane makes it antigenic. All right, anything that sticks out of that membrane makes it antigenic. It's not, you know, we know that. In principles, you should have heard like antigen A for A type blood. I don't know if they talk about that in principles, do they? Antigen B for B type blood, or they just wait and say, hey, you'll have it in the spring of the next year, and you know, he should be some basics, right? Some basic in principles, maybe. I, I don't know. I haven't sat through it, but maybe, maybe one day they'll let me teach principles. All right, glycoprotein dimers. So you have, so I'll know what's in there, right? I got to teach it to know sometimes. Here is um, alpha one, alpha two. And you see that this little thing says here, the CD8, remember that cluster differentiation number eight we talked about? It binds to the alpha three region, okay? That's important. So if you're gonna take a jump and say, hey, I now know something, who, which, which, which T cell would you say is associated with class one MHC molecules? It would be the one that bears the CD8, right? And who bears the CD8? I know y'all went home Monday and Tuesday and studied this stuff. He's working on chapter four. 
I didn't hear that. Which cell was it in? <laughs> which which lymphocyte is associated with CD8? Hmm? It is a T cell. We have we have a couple of names for them. CD4. CD4. No, CD8. 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 CD8 T cell. That's a special name. Cytotoxic. cytotoxic T cell. That's it. The kind of cytotoxic T cell is the CD8. So there's where it associates with. This is why we went back to this chapter where we see that pick up right there. All right. So class one molecules, you definitely have to remember they're associated with CD8, and they're associated with cytotoxic T cell. What's the other one? Is there two cytotoxic? Yeah. Well, we're getting to the second one. We're getting to one here, man. Keep that one. Now we're going to move to MHC2, class 2 molecules. They're found primarily on antigen presenting cells. So look where they are. All right? They're with the B lymphocytes, the monocytes, the macrophages, the dendritic, and the thymic epithelial. Ah, how about that? So you definitely have to know that group too. So if I was dividing up what? T cells versus B cells, where which one would be associated with which? Right now. We have class two associated that found on the antigen presenting cell, which is B, monos, macros, dendritic, and thymocytic epithelial. And look here. This one has a different structure. It has alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. So we took away alpha three and we added beta two, right? So it has two non-covalently bond polypeptides that stick out of its membrane. And look what it says right here. It says CD4 binds over here to the beta two. And the CD4 now is associated with class two MHCs and CD8s are associated with class one, okay? So when we did that double positive, when we started in the thymus and we got there, we were like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't quite understand why it's binding to make it double, why both are binding to those little things on the antigen presenting cell. Now we're fixing to see that, okay? So what is the role of the class one molecules in the immune response, right? Class ones, they process endogenous antigens. Okay, like that, right? Class one, process endogenous antigen. So we're gonna see that inside the cell is where MHC ones are gonna come from. The role of class two, their molecules participate in the exogenous pathway of antigen presentation. Y'all ready for that? that keep that straight. That class one MHCs are endogenous, meaning what's the antigen inside the cell already? And class twos are associated with exogenous antigen presentation. Can we get some other stuff? I'm good. That's the take home. The take home has got to figure out where, where these are going to be generated from. One's going to be within, one's on the outside. So we think we've got this down. Important in tissue transplant procedures. If we worked at the um, Mid-South Transplant Center over in Memphis, um, where you know their work is the ML, uh, MHC typing, okay? They do that. They do the marker typing of all the tissue. Because we want to make sure class one and class two can induce that don't, they don't induce crap rejection. And they appear to play a role in autoimmune diseases too. So we're gonna see that plenty this semester as we move through autoimmunity. So here is some, is it kind of like a, like a intro to autoimmune, okay? Diseases associated with HLA alleles and diseases, that's human leukocyte antigens. 
see this ankylosing spondylitis, inflammation of your vertebrae. It's only found on a HLA allele, it's B27, strength of association, three pluses. Celiac disease, somebody that suffers from diarrhea, weight loss, and they can't have gluten. So if you're, you're on a gluten-free diet, because you've been told you may have celiac disease, okay, that is with DQ2, DQ8, right? Remember the DQs, we talked about that was a, what? Last two, was it? One, two, and then three was in the middle. So you can see where these alleles are coming from. Rheumatoid arthritis, another autoimmune inflammation of multiple joints, DR4. Type 1 diabetes, which is known as juvenile diabetes, okay, because of destruction of the insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas, DQA, DQ2. Okay. So these are things people are pretty much born with, right? This one for sure. Rheumatoid shows itself a little later, celiac, a little later, yeah. You know. We know these autoimmune diseases that we have. Now we kind of know where they're associated with. All right. So that is chapter two. So we've started four. We started it the other day. Four is going to be. It's going to seem a little easier this time when we get back to four. And then five is our antibodies, okay? Yay, we got antibodies coming. We still have a few minutes, sorry. We still got like five more minutes, so hang there with me. And it's, uh, we're gonna end share here, if I can do this. And then we're gonna go right back to the thymus and look at it, and then that'll be it. We'll finish there. We want to go back to this adaptive immune immunity PowerPoint. The one you've studied already, right? I saw some of you looking at it this morning. All right, you remember this? So I go back and I'll, sorry, Zoom land, I'll share it with you. What we want to do is we want to work through this now just to get us back where we were. All right, everybody see it? Zoom land, can you see it? Thank you, Brandy. All right, so here comes our what? Thymocyte precursor comes in. It's double negative, meaning it doesn't have what? Doesn't have any of that markers yet, right? It's coming in with nothing. Doesn't have it yet. CDs, the CDs are to come. And we see that that's called double negative. And we see that then we have a, a gamma delta can be out, right? But what we're looking at is a double positive cell. So there's some selection here. So we're just going to move on over to the double positive. And you see that now it has a CD4 and a CD8, right? And you remember what those look like? Because that's going to be what? What are those going to look like? Those are receptors, right? So it's a CD4 receptor now and a CD8 receptor and has a CD3 T cell receptor. So these are all receptors on the double positive T cell matur it's maturity. Okay? So then it's going to go through a stage where we've got an antigen presenting cell right here. That's what this little guy is, the starfish. It's got, it's got a green and a pink on it. And I'm going to have you here today tell me what the green and pink are. You might not. Because we said what? We said that the CD4 will bind to one of these, and CD8 will bind to the other of these. So this antigen presenting cell actually is presenting both. The C word. What's it producing? What's it showing? MAC class ones and twos, right? So we know that who who bind who? What does CD4 bind to? Class two. Twos and CD8 binds to one. 
Okay, so that's a double positive. That's the first selection. So that cell has both. That T cell has both at that point. Came in with none of it. Matures, binds as an antigen. Okay, binds, and that's good, right? And then we see something that says, okay, we can be singly positive now, right? So this CD, this is like a selection, positive selection. And once we see that you have that ability, then we're going to move into what? We're going to lose one or the other, and we'll become our CD8, or we'll come into the CD4, and then we'll talk on Friday. We'll start off by telling the story in a little more detail on how this happens, okay? But you see that there's negative selection here. This is that it doesn't need to be too aggressive because if it's too aggressive, then it stays bound to the antigen presenting cell and it's negative selected out. Okay. We'll talk more about that. This is the step that I wanted you to see that we had to get chapter two in so you'd understand what's going on there. Is there a video for this? Like a scientific video? Scientific video of this? Yeah. I mean, why would you want to see that? Got it written in a book. It's just excellent description. Yeah, That's but really it's like visual. Visual, visual art. I don't know if you can. I mean, all they would do is just show you a diagram, really. But, since you but step up, by step. Yeah, okay. like some like YouTube videos on talking. All right, I will Not show you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to show um, show the class. They had a question as where could we get some info. And I'm going to give you one of my uh, go-tos, and this is a very good review guy. He's on YouTube. He, he speaks with a British accent. I'm not so sure he's British, though, but I think he is, right? And it is a hand, sorry, handwritten tutorial. No, he draws it with a Sharpie. So if you go to handwritten tutorials, okay? And you're like, oh, this is great stuff, right? So you go to his videos, and he does really good with immunology. So let's find what you're looking for. You're looking for T-cell development. He has a 10-minute video that would be great for you to watch about T-cell development. Okay, so he does a little something. We'll get into this a little bit, but I think he shows, yeah, does that look familiar? Double positive. T helper. He's talking while he does it. Yes, but it's in a British accent, so I don't know. But yes, you can watch him draw this in 10 minutes. It would be a very good review for you to get an understanding as we go through Friday. Okay. Did y'all get that in Zoom land? Did y'all y'all need to see it? I can share it. Let me share my screen. Y'all got it? Okay, it's this right here. Right there, T cell development with handwritten tutorials. He's got 287,000 subscribers, but he hand tutors drawing it with a sharpie. Uh, just about everything you'll need in immunology plus some. Okay, so they're very good to pick a topic and watch him explain it. And we used to do this in class back back in the early days, uh, but I really I like this. It's it's really good if you're visual. So. Thanks for jogging my memory on that. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and stop the, the, uh, the meeting, and we'll see you at lab today.